1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 28. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that this does not include the one who puts all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who puts all things in subjection under him, so that God may be all in all. This is the word of God. Lord, we are thankful for the gift of your word, for the fact that you speak, and that when you speak, you bring to life. So speak to us today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, as we looked at lessons from the Battle of Gettysburg, I focused on stories, primarily from the chaplains, that offer practical examples of living a spiritual life and the discipleship that we characterize here at Christ Church as the life of worship, the community of friends, and the purpose of mission. Last week was Commitment Sunday, so it was a perfect day to focus on those lessons. This week is Christ the King Sunday. It falls every year on the final Sunday before Advent, but because it either precedes or follows Thanksgiving, well, we generally ignore its basic themes in favor of messages on thankful living. Two weeks ago, we talked about thankful living. We talked about the themes thanks and giving from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, which Jesus offered as basic practices that help to free us from our anxieties around stuff and allow us to better seek first the kingdom of God. Thankful living is important. It is not, however, the kingdom of God itself. The kingdom in the language of 1 Corinthians, which Chris just read for us, has a goal. It has an end in history. It is not simply that Jesus rules, that Jesus is in charge, that Jesus triumphs over every enemy, including the last enemy of death. All of that is good news. It is not, however, the goal of the kingdom. The goal of the kingdom, the language of 1 Corinthians 15, and it shows up once more in the Paul writings in the New Testament, is that God might be all in all. Now that is an expansive vision of the goal of history. A vision that unites everything and everyone. A vision in which God fills and fulfills all a vision in which the perfect unity of the Holy Trinity is extended and made perfect in the wholeness of our broken world, of our fractured societies, and of our damaged selves. In such a vision, for us to say that God is our God does not mean that we have a unique and exclusive claim to God. Just as if I were to say that my car, the gray Honda Fit, is my car, well, that does involve a unique and exclusive claim because it's not Cindy's car. But when we say this about God, it does not involve a unique and exclusive claim by us upon God. What it does say is that God has a unique and exclusive claim to us, but not us to God. God is just as much the God of our enemies as God is our God, whether or not our enemies choose to acknowledge God. That's tough to hear, though. 
Because like Joshua, we routinely divide up the world into categories of friend or And it makes complete sense if like Joshua, you were sent on God's mission and you were surrounded by enemies. Of course you're going to view the world that way. But the Lord pulls the rug right out from under him and says, neither I am here as commander of the Lord's army. You see, it's dangerous for us to speak as about, God, about us having God on our side because God's kingdom is much larger than even our most expansive visions and dreams. And once we are sure that God is on our side, well, we are no longer open to the possibility that we could be wrong. Have you ever been wrong, brothers and sisters? But boy, if we've got God on our side, it, it just ain't happening. We are right and everybody else is wrong. The stresses of the Civil War divided our nation, north and south, friend or... And they divided our churches. The Methodist Episcopal Church had already lost its African-American brothers and sisters because we had not been properly hospitable, even though we had African-American preachers. We didn't want our black brothers and sisters to be kneeling with us for prayer along with the white folk. So they decided to take their worship elsewhere. Our confirmation class learned about that down at St. George's. But in the run-up to the Civil War, the Methodist Episcopal Church split north and south, and so the Methodist Episcopal Church south was born. The, the Baptist split, thus the Southern Baptist. Many chaplains who volunteered to serve in the war not speaking for all of them, but many of them did because they believed in the cause of their side. Southern chaplains who believed in slavery as a good thing. Northern chaplains who believed in abolition as God's will on earth. Older animosities between Catholic and Protestant persisted. Units on the battlefield were identified by their language or their cultural heritage. The Flying Dutchman, a bunch of Germans who didn't know the language of their commanders, which makes managing a battle a little more difficult. Or the Fighting Irish, the Irish Brigade, friend or foe, one of us or an other. So today, considering Gettysburg and the context of the Civil War, I want to talk about two ways in which we can find ourselves stuck in conflict, dividing ourselves from one another. One is matters of personality, and the other is matters of conviction. And then we want to take this and talk about conflict and humility. So first, how we have conflict around matters of personality, and we'll start with the humorous story Chaplain John Stuckenberg, the only chaplain from the battle to be buried at Gettysburg National Cemetery and a highly educated Lutheran pastor, made this interesting remark about some of his colleagues. He said this, I am surrounded by Methodist chaplains who are very clever but lack cultivation. There you go. Because in those days, Methodist clergy... You didn't have to have an education to be Methodist clergy. You had to love Jesus and be about half nuts. And so they were signing up. And here we have John Stuckenberg, who had, had the best education possible. And he just wished his Methodist colleagues would have a little bit more cultivation to their lives. There were some ways in which there were incompatibilities. And he raises this common struggle that we all experience to deal with personalities that are different from us, almost incompatible with us. You know, we talk about compatibility in the whole area of marriage. And, you know, well, are we compatible? Are we not compatible? You know, in, in some fundamental ways, as compatible as we may be, we're also incompatible. Robin and I learned a lot about that in our first year of marriage. She comes upstairs and she finds me getting my clothes out of my drawer that she has folded and returned to me very nicely after doing the laundry and refolding them the right way. Trying to do it where she doesn't know it because I don't want to, you know, because I don't know how to say something about this because I haven't figured out how to do that. We had an interesting conversation. Can I get an amen? 
Yeah, it was an interesting conversation. We discovered this fundamental incompatibility, but fortunately enough, she is less obsessive than I, at least when it comes to folding laundry, and she was happy to cede to me the work of doing laundry in our marriage. And so from then on, laundry has been folded the right way, <laughs> my way. And, and, and she did convert me. She did convert me on one particular matter of folding patterns, and so now I use her pattern instead of mine. <sighs> How do we deal with that stuff? How do we deal with incompatibilities? The ways that we and others just don't fit? Don't fit together? Don't fit the group that we just happen to be in and have to deal with anyway? One of my classmates and all of my classmates in this Gettysburg course were military chaplains. Report, uh, talked about how Chaplain Corby, he was the one who gave the absolution uh, for the Irish Brigade before they went into battle. Um, and extended it to the soldiers in the south as well. But he followed his men into the wheat field on his horse and calls out behind them, anyone shot in the back, you know how you get shot in the back, right? You, you turn around and you, you, you run away. Anyone shot in the back will be refused a Catholic burial. Now, my chaplain classmate made this remark. He said, just one more guy who probably did not fit well in the parish, but fit well in the army. He found his place there, although he had to go back to parish life and run a university and other things like that, so I don't know how he handled that. I asked one of my classmates, who was approaching retirement in the army, would you go back to serving a parish? His answer, short and quick, no. And then he elaborated, and he elaborated in uh, turning his voice into the patterns of a machine gun, quite deliberately, because he liked the patterns of a machine gun. He had spent years at the tip of the spear. He was well socialized in the patterns of military command. He had no interest in negotiation and group processes that characterized leadership in the church. If somebody was to ask him something about his wife, why this? Or about his kids, why that? Or about why did he choose to do this, pastor? He just had no interest in those kinds of conversation and was going to come out like a machine gun as soon as they asked it. I thought to myself, what a huge resource the church loses because of this incompatibility in personality. I gotta say, in personality, he and I have almost nothing in common, but he loves Jesus. And he understands what it is to experience and embrace pain in the world and in our lives. Now, many of you are well aware of the fact that I am just a little different. That's a fact. And I've watched others, different themselves, struggle to find a place to serve in the church of Jesus Christ, not because Jesus doesn't want them, but because of real incompatibilities in personality and style. I just have to say, it is a sad day when we allow that to stop us from allowing everyone to find a place to serve that is theirs and find a way to offer their unique gift despite the way they are unique. conflict around matters of personality. We also have conflict around matters of conviction. And again, a humorous story from these chaplains. Chaplain Joseph Twitchell, who's the one in last week's story who counseled with a man who was about to be executed for desertion. Father Joseph O'Hagan and Chaplain William Eastman, who was the chaplain from last week's story, the rolling chaplain who rolled from one soldier to another after being injured, trying to visit them after the battle and the pause in the battle. The three of them were chaplains and friends in the Excelsior Brigade. Eastman wrote about their friendship and did so by sharing an amusing story of Twitchell and O'Hagan from their hospital work after the Battle of Fredericksburg. He writes this. After midnight, when exhausted nature demanded an hour of rest, these two lay down to sleep. It was December and bitter cold. Presently, there came a call out of O'Hagan's blanket. Joseph... And the answer was, well, Joseph, because they both shared the same first name. I'm cold, said one, and I'm cold, said the other. Then let's put our two blankets together 
And so they did, lying close with their blankets doubled. And presently there was a moment as of one struggling with suppressed laughter. What are you laughing at, demanded Twitchell. At this condition of things, was the reply from Father O'Hagan. What? At this horrible distress, like the battlefield, the wounded, the hospitals? No, no. But at you and me, a Jesuit priest and a New England Puritan minister of the worst sort, he said that, spooned together under the same blanket. I wonder what the angels think. And a moment later, he added, I think they like it. <laughs> you see, there is a place for theological conviction, and Father O'Hagan and Chaplain Twitchell were on opposite sides of any of a number of issues. There is an even more important place for brotherhood, for sisterhood, for recognizing that the kingdom of God is much larger than my own tribal brand of Christian discipleship. Now, it is hard to find a set of convictions further apart than those of the North and the South in that bitter conflict. Today, we have other conflicts going on, and sometimes they seem as intractable. The rhetoric of the clash of cultures, Christianity versus Islam, the USA versus Arabs, the current conflicts within the United Methodist Church around human sexuality. Sometimes it seems like we forget about all the things that we agree about and focus and fixate instead on the ways in which we disagree. And we too easily treat our enemies, our opponents in these debates as caricatures. Liberals who never read the Bible, conservatives who are always judgmental, rather than honoring our enemies, our opponents, our foes in the debate as people made in the image of God redeemed by the precious blood of Christ and pledged to the same Lord and truly as brothers and sisters. Chaplain Twitchell reports this amazing thing, caring for Confederate soldiers in field hospitals, folks who'd been captured, and discovering them as gentlemen of good birth and education, which for him were the highest compliments he could pay. Father Corby offered absolution before his brigade entered the fray and included both the North and South in that offer of forgiveness because to say that God is our God does not mean that we have a unique and exclusive claim to God. God is just as much the God of our enemies or our brothers and sisters, whoever they happen to be. Conflict in terms of Matters of personality, conflict, and matters of conviction. Conflict and humility. One of my classmates in discussion on combat trauma and the horror of war remarked, war is addictive. It's not just war that's addictive. It's conflict of all kinds to which we can be addicted and, and painfully and awfully attached. That's why the Proverbs includes this line, the one who loves to argue loves sin because sometimes we just love the argument. The letter of James offers the insight that most of our conflict finds its root in our own internal conflict. That is, we are in conflict because we are conflicted. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? And it is the structure of conflict to look at the world as Joshua did, as friend or foe, as enemy, as right or wrong. Once we are sure that God is on our side, we are not open to the possibility that we could be wrong. Chaplain Thomas Caskey of the 18th Mississippi didn't fight in the Battle of Gettysburg. But he was well aware of this fatal flaw. He wrote after the war, oh how many of my fondly loved spiritual children quietly slept without coffins or shrouds in far distant graves. How many had lost faith in God when the cause they believed was right and which they fondly loved went down in a sea of blood. That is the Confederate cause. Our chaplains prophesied success as among the certainties since our cause was right and God was on the side of right. Therefore, the right was bound to triumph. 
I told them they were sowing seeds from which an abundant harvest of infidelity would be garnered in the event that our cause went under. That I did not believe that God had anything to do with the accursed thing from beginning to end on either side. That final victory would depend on courage, skill, numbers, and the heaviest guns best handled. That right and wrong would not weigh as much as a feather on the scale. Now, I do not agree with everything that Thomas Caskey writes. For example, I do believe that God's kingdom has been and remains on the side of freeing slaves. But I'm struck by the power and insight and humility of his argument. A reminder to his own colleagues, other chaplains in the Confederate Army, that once we are sure God is on our side, we are not open to the possibility we could be wrong. And when I read his expression, an abundant harvest of infidelity, I think of so many other conflicts, today even, in which we have earnestly proclaimed that we are right and that God is on our side and therefore everyone else is wrong. For example, I can't begin to count the number of young people who've come to me and said, you know, Pastor JP, I don't think I can believe in Jesus anymore because evolution is so convincing. Really? Is our faith to be entirely predicated on the winner of what I think, at any rate, is an unnecessary creation-evolution debate? Is that the point of it all? Is that the point of our faith? 1,600 years ago, St. Augustine wrote, with regard to reading Genesis, he said, in matters so obscure and far beyond our vision, we find in Holy Scripture passages which can be interpreted in very different ways without prejudice to the faith we have received. In such cases, we should not rush in headlong and so firmly take our stand on one side that if further progress in the search for truth justly undermines this position, we too fall with it. An abundant harvest of infidelity. Indeed, he could have used the same words. So I appreciate the humility of Chaplain Kasky and Augustine around matters with which we draw boundary lines and choose conflict. And I appreciate the humility of President Lincoln who wrote in September 1862, in great contest, each party claims to act in accordance with the will of God. Both may be, both may be, and one must be wrong. God cannot be for and against the same thing at the same time. In the present civil war, it is quite possible that God's purpose is something different than the purpose of either party. Yes, indeed. God's purpose in history is that God might be all in all. As Joshua learned, the conflicts in which we are enmeshed can come to dominate the way we see everything in the world. But even holy conflict, like the conflict that Joshua was sent on, even holy conflict limits our vision. His encounter with the angel of the Lord reset his perspective. As Paul writes, the kingdom of our Lord does not arrive by human means, but by the gift of God, by resurrection. And in this kingdom, all our conflicts, all our attempts to draw boundaries, whether in holiness or in anger, whether in faithfulness or in reaction, fade away as God becomes all in all. Even now, may we discover the humility of Joshua and bow before our king. Lord, We have too often fixated on drawing lines and defining conflict and friend versus foe, whether it's around matters of personality or conviction. And we fixated on those matters and forgotten that you are Lord of all and that you desire to be all in all. We pray that you will bring us face to face with you and your grace and your subversive response to all our conflicts, neither but as commander of the Lord's army, I come. In Jesus' name, amen.
our hymn is a new hymn for us. Behold a broken world. Our God desires to be all in all, even in all of our brokenness. Hymn number 426, I invite you to stand with me.